Hello, I'm Jane Graham, Haematology Consultant at UH&M, and I'd like to welcome you to this introductory lecture on transfusion medicine that marks the start of your year four transfusion training. So in medicine, if you understand for what reason you do something, then you are able to appreciate why it's important to do that. And that means that you make best practice routine habit. And this couldn't be more true than in transfusion medicine, where we often ask you to follow quite specific steps. But hopefully through this training, you'll understand the importance of why we ask you to do that. So transfusion medicine is important to all of you now, and it will remain important to you pretty much irrespective of what you end up subspecializing in. So as a medical student, you need to have very solid understanding of the underlying pathophysiology of transfusion. You also need to have practical skills. Uh, GMC want you to be able to administer blood, even though you'll never do this in your career, unless you end up as an anaesthetist. Um, and then as you become a doctor, what you're going to do is pull this knowledge and clinical skills together so that you are making transfusion decisions and you are demonstrating competency or what we now call capabilities in transfusion medicine. So at Keel in year four, it's all about the practicalities of transfusion, um, combining this new online material with some Teams interactive stuff. And then in year five, you're gonna be using team-based learning to actually apply that knowledge to clinical scenarios. These are the learning objectives for this lecture, which form part of your overall year four learning objectives and will link with the online material that you're asked to do before the small group session. Transfusion in the UK is very safe. So here you've got a picture diagram of what happens in the transfusion process. You can see that the little asterisks in green show you where there is an additional safety measure to improve things. In the UK, we have altruistic donors um, who are screened through question, questionnaires and also through blood testing so that it's safe both for them and for the recipient. We have testing of the first 30 mils of blood so that we can screen patients for infections. The blood stored overnight, which means any white blood cells can kill off bacteria. And then the whole blood is run through a filter, what we call universal leukodepletion. And this removes all the white blood cells, except lymphocytes, which are a similar size to red blood cells. And we know that these white blood cells are often the things that cause febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions. So the things that give people allergic and temperatures when they have a blood transfusion. What you do then with the whole blood is you spin it or centrifuge it. The heavy red blood cells fall to the bottom of the pack. And then these packs are put onto an octopress. Um, and so you squeeze the plasma off the top and you are left with packed red cells. So these packed red cells have a solution called SAGEM added to them. The SAGEM is a sugary solution that gives your anucleate red cells something to live off for the next 35 days. Ah, click. Um, and they, they are stored uh, for 35 days in the UK. The stuff at the top, what you're gonna do is you are gonna squeeze that off um, and you are going to pull together plasma from the same blood group, ideally from men, because this reduces the risk of something called trali, um, and that's frozen down and makes fresh frozen plasma, or plasma for short. From plasma, you can make something called cryoprecipitate. Um, I like to compare this to sort of skimming the full fat off a bottle of uh, skimming the cream off a bottle of full fat milk. So cryoprecipitate is made by slowly thawing your plasma and skimming off all the sort of von Willebrand factor, the fibrinogen, all the really nice clotty stuff. And again, it's scored, stored in the freezer. Um, and after it's thawed, you've got to be careful to keep it at room temperature, otherwise it all precipitates. And then platelets, we can make in two different ways. So you've got pooled platelets where you get four whole blood donors with the same blood group and you pull together their platelets um, and suspend them in something called platelet additive solution, which is a bit like the SAGEM that we give the red blood cells. Um, 
and suspending it in this platelet additive solution is better than suspending it in plasma because you get less allergic and febrile reactions. Or the other way that we get platelets is what we call apheresis platelets. So this is when you have someone who is a platelet donor and instead of coming to be a blood donor every four months, uh, they can come up every two weeks. And so they go onto a machine. The machine takes off whole blood, but it only keeps hold of the platelets and it gives all the red blood cells back. So that means that people don't get anemic each time they donate, which is why they can come back more often. You normally make two to three pools of platelets from this one person's donor. And these donors tend to be safer because they're repeat donors. And we know that repeat donors are safer than first time donors. In the UK since 2019, we have been using UK or we can use UK FFP for everyone. Um, although people born before one year of age have a few tighter restrictions on the donation that you don't need to know about. But prior to last year, we had to give people born after the 1st of January 1996 solvent detergent FFP. So solvent det detergent FFP, um, Octoplas, is a blood product, whereas all the other stuff that we've been talking about are blood components. So they are primary blood components of your whole blood. And when you talk about blood products, what you do is you get the plasma from a thousand plus people, you put it into a big pot and you then fractionate off what you want. So it's a bit like the petroleum industry, um, except for you're gonna fractionate off immunoglobulins, prothrombin complex concentrate, fibrinogen concentrate, what else would you get? A human albumin solution. Um, but these are much more uniform products because they are the average of 1200 people's donations. So whereas blood components are quite variable in their volumes, in their number of cells, etc., these ones are much more uniform. They're also virally inactivated and they come under the MHRA, the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Authority, rather than under the blood quality regulations. Your red blood cells are made by the bone marrow under the influence of erythropoietin. They are this lovely biconcave, a nucleate cell, which means that they're nice and flexible. They've got a large surface area for um, gaseous exchange and they will spend the first couple of days as reticulocytes, which are slightly bigger, um, and then they will live for 120 days. Now, across the red blood cell membrane, you have all these uh, proteins and sugar structures. And it's these that are your red cell membranes. I mean, red cell antigens. And they're called red cell antigens because they are potentially immunogenic. So that means that if your body sees something um, that isn't self, it has the ability to make an antibody to it. Um, and this is something we call an alloantibody but your body also has the ability to make autoantibodies um, against some of the red cell membranes as well. The red cell antigens that we're most interested in are your A and B antigens that make up the ABO blood group. Um, it's called the ABO, although actually it should be called the ABH blood group because everyone has an H antigen. And then if you are blood group A, you have an enzyme that adds an extra sugar to this H antigen to make the A antigen. And if you're blood group B, you have a different enzyme that adds a different sugar. Um, and AB, you have both enzymes, so you have both of these additional sugars. So if you are blood group A, your red cells express the A antigen. If you're B, they express the B antigen. If you're blood group AB, they express both the A and B. And if you're blood group O, you do not express the A or B antigens. Your ABO blood group is uh, dictated by your ABO gene, which is inherited by your parents. Um, a and B blood group is inherited codominantly, whereas O is inherited recessively. So you can see here that if your parents were blood group A and B, you could still be blood group O. 
The thing that is unique about the ABO blood group is something that we call naturally occurring antibodies. So in the food that you eat, in the environment that you live in, your body will meet things that look like the A and B antigens, even though you have never had a blood transfusion. And if you are blood group A, then your phenotype, what you express is the A antigen. We know that your genotype will be AA or AO because of the inheritance pattern. But what is different is you will have naturally occurring anti-B antibodies, or anti-B for short, because you lack the B antigen. Antibodies or immunoglobulin are made by your B lymphocytes as part of your humoral immune system. Uh, vast majority of them, 75% are IgG antibodies. So these have um, just two antigen binding sites um, and they label the antigen that then gets destroyed by macrophages. And then you've got the IgM, which has got these five or this pentamic, this five-fingered structure um, and many more antigen binding sites which leads to very different outcomes that we'll come to at the moment. Um, IgM is what you make initially it then gets changed to IgG and when we are thinking about these naturally occurring anti-A and anti-B antibodies then they are all IgM in structure. So if you have a um, patient whose blood group B, then their red cells express the B antigen and they will have naturally occurring anti-A antibody in their plasma. If you then go and give them a blood transfusion of group A blood, their naturally occurring anti-A IgM antibodies will see the A antigen as foreign. There will be activation of the complement system all the way up to C9. It then drills a hole through the red blood cell, this membrane attack complex, and um, that is your acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. So the red cells are hemolyzed, are broken down, um, and this ABO incompatible transfusion is what we call a never event. It should never happen because the only time that we give people the wrong blood group like this is when people make a mistake um, and label samples incorrectly or don't check the transfusion before they put it up. And so you get intravascular hemolysis um, and all your red cells breaking up. Bang. <laughs> These ABO blood group antigens are essential when you're thinking about universal donation. So when it comes to the universal donor of red cells, it is going to be blood group O because that lacks the A and B antigens. So it can be received by anyone. Um, in the same way, a patient who is blood group AB will have no anti-A or anti-B antigens. So actually they could receive blood from any blood group. The other thing to think about with plasma products, you're interested in the antibodies. So actually blood group AB is the universal donor for plasma. Although, as you saw from the previous slide, not that many people are blood group AB. So actually we use blood group A for our universal donor of platelets and plasma products. And you should only give group O plasma to patients who are group O because of this naturally occurring anti-A and anti-B. So when you send a group and screen sample to the lab, they are going to book the sample in on the computer system and ensure that the details are all correct. If there's any errors, it will get chucked in the bin. They're going to allocate a unique sample number so that they can trace and store that sample. And then they're going to spin the sample to separate the red blood cells from the plasma. And that's why you send an EDTA pink sample um, to the transfusion laboratory. And the key questions they need to answer is what's the ABO blood group and what's the RHD blood group of that patient sample? When you do a 
blood group on someone, then you are using this principle of agglutination between the red cell antigens and these preformed IgM antibodies. So I'm not sure if you did um, something in year two, but on the top you've got a blood grouping card and you can see that there has been agglutination between the patient's red blood cells and anti-A. So the patient must express the A antigen on their red cells. There's been no agglutination when you've added anti-B and there is agglutination with the anti-D. So this patient's blood group, according to this card, is blood group A, RHD positive, and then there's a negative control. So we do on occasion still use these manual techniques, but in the laboratory these days, everything's automated. So we use the same principle, but we are using these gel cassettes um, or an immune capture technology to electronically um, undertake and interpret the results of people's blood group and screening. In the lab to do a group and screen, we first want to do a forward group to establish the patient's ABO and RHD blood group. So we are going to take the patient's red cells and we are going to add it to plasma with known anti-A, with known anti-B, and then with known anti-D. You're going to incubate it. If there is a reaction between the antigen and the antibody, then because of the IgM big structure, all those red cells are going to stick together. And then when you spin the sample in the centrifuge, those cells are all so big that they can't work their way down to the bottom of the gel. Whereas if there's been no agglutination, you have these individual erythrocytes, which when they're spun will just weasel their way down to the bottom of that cassette. So you can see here that there's been no reaction with anti-A, there has been agglutination with anti-B and nothing with D6, so that's your D antigen. So this suggests that the patient is blood group B. You've got a negative control to show that your test is working and then what you're going to do is do something called a reverse group to confirm that what you've found in your forward group is appropriate. So we think the patient is blood group B, and so we would expect them to have naturally occurring anti-A. So with your reverse group, what you're going to do is add the patient's plasma to red cells with known antigens. So here we've added the plasma to red cells expressing the A antigen, and there's been a reaction, which is what we'd expect. And there's been no reaction when you've added red cells from blood group B. So this patient is blood group B, RHD negative, and they have got an appropriate reverse group. I put this picture in because people still call it the rhesus blood group. Um, even obstetricians still call it rhesus. It's RHD. Um, the rhesus monkeys have a very similar blood group, but um, it's incorrect. So please call it RHD. If you are RHD positive, then your red cells express the D antigen. This again is inherited from your parents in a dominant fashion. And in the UK, approximately 85% of people will be RHD positive. Although in places like Asia, this nears 100%. If you are RHD negative, then you do not have the antigen. And that means if you are exposed to the D antigen, either through blood transfusion of D positive components or through um, pregnancy carrying a D positive fetus, then you have the potential to make anti D. There RHD is part of your RH system. So in addition to D, you've got big C, little c, big E, little e. You've got K or Kel, um, which is important for pregnancy and we give all women K negative blood. You've got other blood groups called Duffy, Kid, MNS, etc., which um, are often documented on the blood sample um, and follow a similar pattern to the RHD and such that you don't have antibodies unless you've been exposed to the antigen.
So with hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn, if the mother is negative and the baby is positive, because remember the inheritance from the father, um, because of this dominant inheritance of the D antigen, um, then small numbers of the fetal red cells cross into the maternal circulation. The mother's maternal um, immune system will see these antigens as foreign, so she will make an antibody. These IgG antibodies can then cross the placenta and will then go to form an antibody antigen complex with the baby's red cells, which will then get destroyed. So you get um, fetal anemia as a result of these, and that's why we give prophylactic anti-D, so uh, a blood product which is lots of anti-D immunoglobulin, and that mops up any of these um, fetal RHD expressing cells. Um, and we also give anti-D after a woman's given birth to an RHD positive fetus. Your anti-D antibodies are IgG antibodies. So they're different from your anti-A and your anti-B. Um, and what happens when you get this antigen antibody interaction is you get activation of the complement system, but this time only up to C3. It will label the red blood cell as defective. So macrophages will come along, engulf it, it'll get taken to the reticular endothelial system, and those red cells will be phagocytosed. They'll be got rid of. And so that is your extravascular hemolysis. Um, and that's what happens in your delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions, which will be your anti-D and all those other rarer blood groups that I mentioned in the previous slide. In the screen part of your group and screen, you're asking, has my patient got any preformed antibodies? Because if they have, I know that if I gave them antigen positive blood, that there would be this antibody antigen interaction and the patient would break down those red blood cells. So I want my group and screen to be an accurate reflection of their antibody status. And um, so depending on whether or not they've been transfused or been pregnant in the previous three months will influence how long my sample is valid. And what you're going to do is um, you're going to take the plasma off the top of your spun anticoagulated sample. You are going to add three sets of cells. They're going to be group O. So you take out the ABO blood group system from this. And on those cells, you have known antigens. You're going to incubate the red cells and the patient's plasma and look to see whether or not there is an antigen antibody interaction. And if there is, um, there'll be agglutination. And then when you spin those cells, those will stay on the top. And what you would do then is go and do further tests to find out which of those antigens um, the patient has an antibody against. When you need to actually issue blood for um, a patient, then you are going to cross-match blood. Um, nowadays, however, most people don't have serological cross-match, they have something called electronic issue. And what you're doing there is asking yourself whether the chosen blood is appropriate for that recipient. There are um, caveats involved, so you need to make sure that you've had two independent samples, so you are 100% sure that you know what ABO and RH blood group the patient is. Um, they need to have a valid group and screen. They can't have any hint of having previous antibodies. Um, and it's completely computerized so that there's no risk of humans making errors. The way that you guys think that it's done is this concept of serological cross-matching. So again, you're saying, have I got the right or a compatible bag of blood out of the fridge to go with my patient? Um, but what you're going to do here is you are going to um, take a sample of the blood from the plastic tube that comes out of the top of this donated unit, and you are going to incubate that with the patient's plasma. Um, spin it and look to see whether or not there's been signs of agglutination. And if there isn't any agglutination, then that unit would be classed as compatible. And it takes around 40 minutes um, to do a serological cross-match 
versus around 10 minutes to do electronic issue. In the emergency setting, um, then we've already talked about the fact that your blood group O RHD negative units are going to be appropriate for pretty much everyone. Um, however, only 6% of the donor population are blood group O negative. And so you actually only want to use O negative when you really have to. And so in the emergency setting, we actually give men O RHD positive blood because it doesn't cause them a problem there and then. Yes, they might go on to make anti-D antibodies, but they're never going to get pregnant um, and we wouldn't give them RHD positive blood in the elective setting. So unless they were involved in another road traffic accident, um, then it wouldn't be a problem. So we've talked about this already. Um, our universal group for red cells is OD negative. Um, for plasma, it's blood group AB uh, because it doesn't have any antibodies, although we know this blood group is very rare, so we use blood group A. And when we think about platelets, um, again, it's the ABA, but actually platelets contain a few red cells, so you'd also want to give D negative, whereas plasma products D is irrelevant because there are no red cells in there. Which brings us on to the very, very badly labelled two sample rule, um, which should have been called the historic policy rule. And you've got here the actual um, legal reason why we have to do it. But I've explained to you that if you give an ABO incompatible blood transfusion, um, you get this acute hemolytic transfusion, you break up all your red cells, intravascular hemolysis, you've got a one in three chance of dying. And it happens because essentially people sample the wrong person, well, they sample the right person, then they get distracted and write someone else's details on it. Um, and we used to process the sample twice in the lab um, to prove that it was blood group A, apart from the fact there's no issue with our sample, uh, there's no issue with our processing in the lab. The problem is the fact that you get distracted in the clinical side. So what we say is outside of the emergency setting, you need to have a confirmed blood group um, before we will issue blood components for your patient. So you take a single sample um, and if the patient needs a transfusion and they haven't got a historic sample, most people have, um, then you might be asked to take another sample before they release the blood to you. They'll get everything ready, but they just won't release it until they can be 100% sure that your patient is the ABO blood group that you say that they are. And we do um, or we ensure patient safety um, by this concept of positive patient ID. So you need to say to the patient, what's your name? What's your date of birth? You check it against the wristband. You take your sample and label the sample at the patient's bedside using the wristband um, before you walk away. And that way you can be confident that you have everything correct because there's something called the zero tolerance policy, which basically means if you make a slight typo, they will chuck it in the bin and you will be asked to bleed your patient again. That concludes your half hour introductory lecture to transfusion medicine. We've covered the safe production of your primary blood components and also touched on the production of blood products. We've talked about your naturally occurring anti-A and anti-B antibodies and how these are IgM and result in acute hemolytic transfusion reactions. 
we've talked about the RH antigen um, which is potentially immunogenic so if you're exposed to the antigen either through transfusion or pregnancy then you can form an aloe antibody to this antigen and if you were then exposed to the antigen again this would either lead to a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction or potentially hemolysis of fetal red blood cells. You are aware of what we do in the lab um, for a group and screen. It's about establishing the ABO and RH blood type of the patient and identifying whether there are any antibodies in their plasma. You know that most red cells are issued through electronic issue or electronic cross-matching um, where a group of A blood is taken off the shelf and given it to a patient who is blood group A. Um, however, if there are any concerns about antibodies um, or any manual steps in the process that we would use serological cross-match. And we've touched on this concept that positive patient identification and in following correct practice reduces this risk of ABO incompatible transfusions and human error, which is the biggest risk when it comes to transfusion. So uh, the key take home messages on reflection are that blood transfusion in the UK is safe, um, but that if you take shortcuts, you put patients at risk. And as clinicians, it's important that you understand the underpinning immunology and the logistics of transfusions so that you can uphold safe practice throughout your career.